Hello. Today's lesson, we're going to answer the question, what is chemistry? Which makes sense because that's what we're going to be studying in class this year. To start things off, let's begin with a definition. What is chemistry? Chemistry is the study of matter and the changes it undergoes. Chemistry is the study of matter and the changes it undergoes. What is chemistry? Chemistry is the study of matter and the changes it undergoes. There are two parts to this definition, matter and changes. Let's elaborate in more detail. There are three ways that chemists classify matter. Matter can either be an element or a compound or a mixture. An element. An element is considered the building block of matter. It cannot be broken down. Its smallest part is an atom. Except for seven elements. and I'll elaborate on them in a moment. And the best way to describe them, looks like I'm going to need more room here, pardon. We recognize an atom by having one type of atom. Now let's get back to this part here about the smallest part is an atom. If we were to open a bag of M&Ms and you reach in and you pull out individual candies, that's all, whether it's the yellow or the green or the blue or the red or the brown color, all of them are M&M candies. An element works in the same fashion. If we have an element of carbon and we reach in to a bag of carbon and are able to pull out the smallest pieces, we will pull out atoms of carbon. They are all one type of atom. If I were to perhaps try to model this with a picture, maybe I would have a sample of matter with all triangles, one type of atom. Now there are seven elements on our periodic table where this is not true. So let's also make note that elements they are found on the periodic table. And that's the most important tool to chemists. We'll spend a lot of time next unit going over all of the information that the periodic table can give us. And we're going to reference it for the whole entire year. But the seven elements whose smallest part is not an atom, they are actually called Sorry, I'm trying to put a little carrot here. They are called diatomic elements. Diatomic, meaning there are two atoms. And again, they have to be identical that are bonded together. So a diatomic element, to draw a model of that, 
might look like this. Again, it's one type of atom because that's how we define an element. However, they are, two of them are touching each other. That's how we know it's a diatomic element. Let's look at the next type of matter, a compound. Compounds are when we have two or more elements chemically bonded together. As a result of these elements being chemically bonded together, they can be separated by reverse chemical reactions. <coughs> Excuse me. Their smallest part is a molecule or a formula unit and you know which it is because it depends on the bond holding the atoms together. So if I were to try to draw a model of this, because I need to have two or more elements chemically bonded together, let's look at the elements that I started with in the first example, the triangles and the circles. If I took them and chemically bonded them together, perhaps I would look like this. I have two or more elements represented by the two different shapes, and they are, the shapes are touching each other to represent that they're chemically bonded together. Both an element and a compound are considered to be substances. Some people put the adjective pure in front of that, not everybody, though. In other words, when you look at their sample of matter, all of the particles are identical. That's why they're referred to as pure substances. When you look at a sample of matter and it's not identical, that leaves us with our final category, the mixtures. A mixture is a physical blend of two or more substances. Literally, they're mixed together, so these can be separated easily. without the need for chemical reactions. There are two kinds of mixtures, homogeneous or homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures.
Homogeneous or homogeneous mixtures are when the ratio is the same throughout the sample of matter. The only time you'll have a homogeneous mixture is when you have a solution. That's the only time. And a solution is where you have one substance dissolved in another. If dissolving didn't take place, then you do not have a solution, therefore you do not have a homogeneous or homogeneous mixture. Instead, you have a heterogeneous mixture. A heterogeneous mixture is where the ratio of the components of the mixture is different throughout the sample of matter. If I were to try to draw a model of what a mixture could possibly look like using some of the ones we've got so far, perhaps I have something that looks like this, where I have a sample of matter where the particles are no longer identical to each other. That's indicative of a mixture. It is no longer a pure substance. Before we leave the first part of this definition, chemistry is the study of matter. So we're going to be exploring this year whether our matter are elements, compounds, or mixtures. We're also going to be looking at the various states that these matter can exist in. There are four states of matter. The first is called solid, the second is liquid, the third is gas, and the fourth is plasma. The first three I'm sure you've had a lot of exposure to in your science classes so far in your education. In the solid state of matter, we have particles that are very close together. They have a definite shape. And as a result, a definite volume. Liquid, the particles are a little further apart. Particles have some space, I'll describe it. between them. One property of a liquid is that they flow. So the fact that there's space between the particles is what allows them to flow. They have an indefinite shape. Think of a popular liquid called water. When you put water in a glass, it takes the shape of the glass. If you take that water and then pour it out of the glass onto the floor or your countertop, now it looks like a puddle. It has a different shape. Liquids take the shape of the container that they're in. However, they have a definite volume. If you put one cup of water into a glass and then took that water and poured it out, you would now have one cup of water that looks like a puddle. So the amount of space or volume that it occupies will always be the same. However, the shape of the liquid will be dependent upon what container it's in. Moving on to the gaseous state of matter, the particles have a lot of space between them.
Gases have an indefinite shape and indefinite volume. If you want to think of your breath as an example of gas, when you are speaking or you breathe out, the gas is going to take up the space that of the room that it's in and therefore its shape. If I were to blow into a balloon to inflate it, it'll take up the shape of the balloon and occupy whatever space that balloon is going to expand to. The fourth and final state of matter is plasma. Plasma is not a state of matter that we are going to work with at all in our laboratory area. However, it's important to at least recognize that it does exist. Plasma is defined as high energy ions in the gaseous state. So as you look at these states of matter and we progress from a solid to a liquid to a gas to a plasma, plasma is still the gaseous state. However, we now have high energy ions. Ions are particles with a charge, so we have things like electricity here, and we get the high energy by increasing the temperatures. So where might you see plasma in our everyday existence? The material of the sun, lightning, some of your lights and TV screens. For those of you who maybe want to add blood, to the example, because you know that plasma is a part of blood. Oops. Same word, different definition. Plasma is of blood, is a liquid, not the plasma state of matter. So again, same word, but different definition. Speaking of definitions, let's go back to our definition of chemistry. Chemistry is the study of matter and the changes it undergoes. We've dealt with the first half. What about matter? Matter can either be classified as an element, a compound, or a mixture, and that element, compound, or mixture could exist in the solid, liquid, gas, or plasma state of matter. Now let's talk about the different changes that matter can undergo. There are three that we'll talk about. The first is called a physical change. This type of change manipulates the appearance of matter, but not what matter is made up of. So changes the appearance of the matter, but not what the matter is made up of. So for example, if I were to rip paper, Right, it starts out like a rectangle, and then I tear it. So the paper now looks different. The rectangles are smaller, the edges perhaps are a little jagged on one side of each rectangle, but ultimately the matter, meaning the element, the compound, or the mixture that the paper is made up of, it hasn't changed, but what the paper looks like has changed. Um, another example, melting. All right, if I have an ice cube and it melts into a puddle, this ice cube is made up of water. So is this puddle. The matter hasn't changed, but what it looks like has. 
Those are examples of physical changes. Change number two is a chemical change. A chemical change changes the appearance of matter and what the matter is made up of. So this changes both the appearance and composition of matter. Another way to say it is that something new is made. And that something new is made from a chemical reaction. For example, I happen to love putting salt on my french fries. And for those of you who don't know, salt is the chemical formula NaCl. Its name is sodium chloride. For those of you who don't know that yet, that's all right. As we progress in our journey in chemistry, we will learn how to name it, where the formulas come from, etc. Hopefully, based upon our lesson today, you're already starting to look at this and think, oh my gosh, two different elements, therefore, this must be a compound. If you're not there yet, that's all right, you will be. Well, sodium chloride is made from these two elements, sodium and chlorine. Why did I write a two after the chlorine? Well, that's because it's one of those seven elements that are diatomic meaning they're gonna have two atoms bonded together. I'll let you know in a few minutes what the elements are that are diatomic, because there are only seven of them from the periodic table. Well, the whole point of this is that if I look at these two elements, sodium is a metal. It's a solid. It's sort of silver in color. Chlorine, the element, is a gas. It's yellow-green in color. And it's actually poisonous. Oh, I can't fit that there. Poisonous. When I take these two elements and force their matter to change. We make something new. We're able to make salt. And for those of you who also love to put salt on your french fries, you know that it's a solid, and that it's white in color, and that it's kind of like a crystal. That is totally new and totally different from the elements or the matter that made it up. So that's how we know a chemical change is going to take place. Something new is made from a chemical reaction. Now it's kind of easy when you see the codes and whatnot, but when you're in your everyday life or you're in the laboratory, there are some things that we can observe. That are going to let us know whether or not chemical changes are occurring. Now, chemical changes are also called chemical reactions. All right, observation number one, heat and or light is given off. Perhaps some of you are thinking of fire, and you're right, when you're burning a piece of wood, heat and light is given off. 
that's an observation that we can make in our everyday life to indicate that that wood is undergoing a chemical change. Evidence number two, a gas has evolved. Some of your brains, when you hear gas, think of farts or burps, and you're right. Those are the byproducts of digestion, which is a chemical process. Maybe your brain doesn't go there and you're starting to think of, oh, I remember when I was younger and I mixed baking soda and vinegar and I saw all those bubbles being created to make that volcano experiment. You're right, that's an observation that a chemical change is taking place between the baking soda and the vinegar because you can see a gas being evolved. Number three is the formation of a precipitate. A precipitate to a chemist does not mean rain. Precipitation to a meteorologist means rain. But a precipitate to a chemist is a solid that forms when two solutions react. And I will put a video into our classroom that allows you to watch a precipitate being formed. It's really an observation you'll only make in the laboratory. There aren't any examples of it in your everyday life. The fourth and final observation would be a color change. However, we need to put an asterisk next to it because it's not always proof. So for example, we are entering the autumn season and the leaves are going to start to change color from green to yellow, gold, orange, red. Those examples of a color change are indications of chemical reactions taking place in the leaves. However, if you're in your kitchen and you're making some cherry Kool-Aid, your glass of water starts out clear and colorless and when you add the cherry Kool-Aid mix, now your water looks red. That is not an example of a chemical change because again, no new matter was made. When you have water and your Kool-Aid mix, you, that's a physical change. You can boil off the water and still have your Kool-Aid mix. The color change is only true when we have new matter made from the change. All right, so getting back here, the different changes that matter can undergo, I originally had three in our list. And I need to move bullet number three down to here. All right, the last type of change that we're going to be studying in chemistry is that of nuclear change. As the name implies, a nuclear change involves changes to the nucleus of atoms. Changes to the nucleus of an atom. You do not see this in your everyday life. However, perhaps you're aware of the H-bomb, which is fusion. That's also the chemical reaction in the sun or the atom bomb, that's fission reactions. Or maybe you know of medicinal applications where they're doing different types of radiation treatments um, or perhaps a transmutation. Reaction. Again, we're not going to witness any chemical, uh, nuclear changes, excuse me, in the laboratory this year. It's simply something that we have to recognize it exists and we're gonna have to recognize it on paper. So before we conclude our lecture, the last thing I would like for us to embellish on is the diatomic elements. 
what seven elements need to be bonded together? So let's write that down below here. Our seven diatomic elements. And this is something that you're going to need to memorize. All right. I'm going to write it first. Capital B, lowercase r. Capital I. Capital N. Capital C, lowercase l. Capital H. Capital O. Capital F. The reason why some of our letters are capitalized and others are lowercase is because these are meant to represent the symbols of the element. The first letter in every element symbol will always be capitalized, and the second letter, if there is one, will always be lowercase. Let's go over what the names of each of these elements are. Br is bromine. I is the symbol for iodine. Maybe you call it iodine, that's fine. N is the symbol for nitrogen. Cl is the symbol for chlorine. H is the symbol for hydrogen. O is the symbol for oxygen, and F is the symbol for fluorine. When you sound out these elemental symbols in this order, it's pronounced Brinkelhoff, and a lot of chemistry teachers choose to name their cats Brinkelhoff. That's how I'm going to be referring to it. For those of you who are visual learners and you want to investigate the periodic table, they are arranged in a somewhat fat, uh, pattern here where N, O, F, C, L, B, R, and I form the shape of the number seven. But when you count, there's always one, two, three, four, five, whoopsie daisies. One, two, three, four, five, there are only six elements. The seventh is hydrogen. So for those of you who are visual learners, perhaps you would prefer to remember the diatomic elements based upon where they're located on the periodic table. But anytime we need to refer to them, I will be using the Brinkelhoff. So at this point in our lecture, we have answered the question, what is chemistry? Chemistry is the study of matter and the changes it undergoes. There are three ways that matter can be classified, elements, compounds, and mixtures. And those can be existing in the solid, liquid, gas, or plasma state of matter. Matter can undergo either a physical, chemical, or nuclear change. And chemists study all of this. So looking ahead to our year, we've got a lot to go through, and it's a wonderful journey, and I am so excited that you are on the path with me, and we will take it together. Please stop the lecture and go into the Google Classroom to watch the demonstration of a precipitate. Thanks for watching.